and discuss the issue. <clears throat> All right, so the way uh, I'm gonna structure the workshop is that I'm gonna talk about AI for a bit and give you a particular example, which is pretty similar to the exercise that we are gonna undertake in this workshop. In this workshop, we are going to uh, rate images based on uh, how beautiful we find the urban scene to be. There's an example which we have already undertaken where we got a whole bunch of Indians to rate how safe an urban scape is. So I'm gonna give an example, give that exercise as an example, and then we will kick on from there. <clears throat> Along with that, uh, we will look at how we can use the Flickr API to automate downloading images, you know, with search tags. Something similar can also be done with Google, but the procedure or the process for that is longer and more tedious. So I'm gonna to stick to the example with Flickr. And then we'll have um, hands-on examples of how the image segmentation script works uh, how uh, color detection works with images. And then tomorrow we're gonna train a neural network, which will correlate the images to the beauty scores. And in between what I would expect from you guys is I have prepared an Excel sheet. It's uploaded in the folder that I've shared. If you could take about an hour's time between today's session and tomorrow's and there are certain images next to your name. If you could rate those, and I'll talk about the process. There are nine options, nine different ratings. If you could pick the one that you feel is appropriate for the images allocated to you, then we can use those ratings itself in training the neural network. So in a way, you'll get an idea of the entire process. Typically, when we talk about any AI process, uh, around 70% of the time is spent in collecting data. And only in the last 30% do you clean the data, do you train the neural network, and you end up deploying. Uh, the and at the end, you uh, end up uh, deploying the trained neural network to uh, run on new data set. So we're going to do. <laughs> Um, sorry about that. Uh, yeah, so we're going to go through those steps. Uh, and there were a few participants who mentioned that they have very little to no idea about AI. So I'll briefly talk about that as well. Some of you who have kind of uh, more than beginner level or more than intermediate level <clears throat> knowledge about it may find the first few minutes redundant. But of course, the rest of the workshop will present something new. Um, and at any moment, if you have any comments to make or any questions to ask, kindly unmute yourself. Uh, I don't really need to wait till the end of the presentation to have the discussion. We can have it uh, in between as well as I'm presenting. Right, uh, before I get into specifics, I would like to contextualize uh, where the development of AI in design is at the moment so that at the end of the day, uh, we can be realistic about the quality of output that we can expect from the use of AI processes. <clears throat> and to contextualize the development, I will first talk about AI in general. Uh, this image is from 1997, and the gentleman on, on the left uh, was one of the chess grandmasters at the time. He goes by the name of Gary Kasparov, and the game is actually not being played with the gentleman on the right in the dark suit. The game is, as you may have guessed, is being played between the computer in the background and Gary Kasparov on the left. Uh, the program which played against Gary Kasparov at the time was developed by IBM and the program was called Deep Blue. 
Now, at the time, uh, uh, by the end of the set of games, uh, the computer had indeed, or rather Deep Blue had indeed beaten Gary Kasparov, and it became a worldwide sensation in the sense that uh, that was the first time that a computer had actually ended up defeating a chess grandmaster convincingly. <clears throat> and in pop culture, uh, it started a discussion, some uh, dystopian and cynical, uh, which spoke about man versus uh, AI. And then, I mean, you can guess all sorts of conclusions and speculations that were drawn at the time. At the time, this uh, program was called AI because at the time, <clears throat> that was the most evolved case uh, of a program which took on a human in the game of chess. But at the core of the program was no pattern recognition. There was no intelligence, so to speak. The computers had become efficient enough by 1997 to simply use brute force to search through all the possible sets of moves given the state of the board and then figure out the set of moves or three or four series of moves which would be most appropriate to win the game. So in, in technically speaking, now that we can look back at this event, it wasn't really AI versus Gary Kasparov. It was indeed uh, instead um, computer efficiency in terms of search algorithms versus Gary Kasparov. But as I said, this was the first time something like this happened. So people jumped on the bandwagon of AI and this got built, this got <clears throat> built as AI winning against humans. However, this was not the case. This example is important because if you run, uh, if you, do literature study or if you run searches then you will find this example being cited again and again now the first uh, really successful example of ai in terms of um, solving games or winning games against humans is concerned happened much later more than 15 years later between uh, alphago which was developed by google makes sense in from 1997, 15 years fast forward, IBM kind of became obsolete in the software development uh, space. Google had kind of taken over. So this time AlphaGo was developed by Google and this is the game of Go. And AlphaGo went head to head against Lee Sedol, who at the time was one of the best Go players in the world. Now, for the uninitiated, this may look kind of a simpler version of chess or may not look as complicated as chess because by the looks of it, there are a, <clears throat> we can see a whole bunch of white and black pebbles on the board. What's the complication? What's the complexity? The complexity is in the number of combinations that are possible on the board. And pay attention to this statistic. Um, the number of combinations in the game of Go is greater than the number of atoms in the observable universe or the universe that we can directly observe, which would include Earth and Moon. Uh, that's a staggering number of combinations, higher than the number of atoms present in the observable universe, the surface of Earth and surface of Moon. And even though computers by now had become way more efficient compared to 1997, they had not become efficient enough to literally use crude force to go through so many different options. Instead, of course, uh, Google had to develop really intricate pattern recognition systems, which are at the core of neural network training or, or execution of AI and also learning of AI. At the time, what they did was they recorded humans playing against humans, and they had a database of around 30 million moves, not 30 million games, but 30 million moves. And Google taught the software to watch the videos and recognize the state of the board 
and at the same, same time recognize which move is being played. Now with those two data points, how the board is at an instant and which move is being played at that instant as a response to the state of the board, those two data points. And of course, as an output, was it a favorable move or not a favorable move? So these two input data points and the output data point of winnability score or did the human win or not? That's all. That's all. And uh, of course, AlphaGo was trained on 30 million such moves and it was trained again and again and again. And <clears throat> what ended up happening was because AlphaGo wasn't passed on expert advice in, in how to play the game of Go. And what do I mean by expert advice? Whenever we start to pick up any sport or any game, be it football or rugby, uh, some of the experts tell us certain tricks or certain shortcuts or certain techniques that they have mastered or observed through their tacit knowledge or lived experience of the game. Now, those are indeed smart advisors. However, in, in the world of computation, those are called biases. Now, since AlphaGo wasn't presented such tips or tricks, which are basically biases, AlphaGo detected patterns of play which were not apparent to humans. And it did end up playing a couple of movesets which bewildered the onlookers at the time. And not only was Lee Sedol defeated, but he went on to appreciate uh, new patterns of play. As you can read from the quote at the bottom, saying that it is not a human move. I've never seen a human play this move. And he went on to add, so beautiful. So we've kind of made one step jump. That is, uh, instead of brute force, now, uh, AI scientists can develop or detect patterns to play a game. They no longer need to rely on brute force to search through literally millions of uh, possibilities. However, at this point, remember, the data set used to train the neural network at the time was explicit videos of humans playing against humans. So in a way, the amount of data set that could be used to train the neural network or to train the AI system was limited by the amount of videos that could be collected of humans playing against humans, which was solved a couple of years later when uh, Google developed AlphaGo Zero as the successor or version two of AlphaGo. And in this case, uh, they did not rely on videos of humans playing against humans. AlphaGo or, or the system AlphaGo Zero was taught the rules of the game and it started playing against itself. And each time it played against itself, it got a little better. And that process repeated again and again and again. And I think if I'm not wrong, uh, right at the end of three days of training itself, AlphaGo Zero, which didn't learn anything from the videos, was made to play against AlphaGo, which was in the previous slide, which uh, was taught or trained on videos of humans. And AlphaGo Zero, which is the current version, ended up defeating AlphaGo by a score of 100 to 0. Mind it, at the end of just three days of training of AlphaGo Zero playing against itself. Now, this uh, method solved a very critical bottleneck in terms of developing AI algorithms, wherein now, as a, as a step or as a paradigm shift, uh, AI algorithms were no longer dependent on data that was explicitly presented by humans. Uh, algorithms could play against itself or they could interact with themselves or interact with itself or a, a, a duplicate copy of itself and generate data from that interaction and then train itself to make the process better or to make the pattern detection better. So three pretty significant developments in terms of gamification. Now, 
to if I have to bring it back into the context of design, art, and architecture, I will compare uh, the development of AI with how parametric design tools uh, got developed. Uh, I'm pretty sure most of you know that way back in the early 1990s, uh, Frank Gehry was looking to construct uh, the Barcelona Fish and the Gaganai Museum in Bilbao. And at the time, the typical tools used by architects did not have flexibility in terms of representing such complicated shapes. And representation, even if very tedious and difficult, could be done. What it absolutely did not have, those tools did not have the capability of rationalizing the surface, let's say triangulating the surface or getting rid of steep curvatures. And then of course, automation of trying production, uh, the capability of it wasn't present in the tools. Uh, so what he ended up doing was he hired a person called Rick Smith from CATIA, C-A-T-I-A, which was the software CATIA at the time was predominantly used by the automobile industry and the aerospace industry. As we know, vehicles, cars, and flights, airplanes, um, have a lot of double curved surfaces, which is why KTR was used a lot in those industries. And Frank Gehry brought in Rick Smith to sort of model and rationalize these buildings. And this happened in the early 1990s. Remember, by a certain designer who was already famous across the world, which meant that Frank Gehry had a uh, significant amount of resources at his disposal. So just one singular example, borrowing technology from another industry. And from then it took almost around 15 years, 17 years for Revit and Grasshopper to be released. Now I, I know Revit is not explicitly parametric in terms of, or wasn't parametric at the time explicitly in terms of how we could interact with the software, but remember the way families are defined in Revit, the way certain numerical inputs change the geometry, render Revit to be parametric. The parametricism or, or the, the algorithm was internalized. We couldn't edit them at the time. However, it was an example of parametric software nonetheless. Now, right now, the business of AI in the domain of art, architecture, and design is at this 1991 to 1993 phase, where different people quite often independently are sort of getting into a lot of research. Only certain examples are seeping into professional design practices, um, and we're still speculating. Uh, whatever you see all across is still at the speculative stage. What AI is good at right now is in analyzing designs. What AI is good at right now is in crunching real estate profitability estimations. What AI is still not good at is dealing with geometries because how do we represent geometries is a really big problem. Now, if you just talk about numbers, uh, so a single number, the kind of space it occupies, the kind of time it takes to crunch a single number, and you compare that to a geometry, how many vertices we would need to represent that geometry. Each vertex would have x, y, z value, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, the size of the data increases many folds, and how do you make a geometry interact with another geometry? if we break it down into components without losing the overall integrity of, of the geometrical piece. That's a, that's, a, that's a challenge that has not been solved yet. So as I said, we are in this early stage where most of the examples are rather speculative in nature. They cannot be directly handpicked and deployed in a professional setting. Now, going back, uh, to the examples that I had cited earlier, those were all examples of 
solving games or, or solving board games, so to speak. Now, in 2018, a watershed moment happened in terms of uh, designers picking up um, in terms of designers picking up the exploration of AI, so to speak. Uh, this portrait on the right goes by the name of portrait of Edmund de Bellamy. And this portrait was uh, auctioned by Christie's in 2018. Christie's at the time happened to be one of the leading art auction houses set up in New York and London. And it, it was sold for almost as much as half a million dollars. As you may have guessed, this was not painted by an artist. Instead, <clears throat> it was uh, churned out or conceptualized or, it, or, or the pixel data was crunched or it was painted. Pick your phrase, pick your word, however you want to look at it. Uh, and how you want to look at it and which verb you use is not only a technical question, but is also a philosophical question because is it really a painting or is it data crunching? How, how you want to decide that is, is up to you. There's no direct consensus on this yet. Um, the way this painting was arrived at, I'm going to use arrived at instead of painted, uh, was that the scientists trained a neural network on 15,000 different portraits that were painted by humans between the 14th century and the 20th century. And the AI algorithm was trained to detect edges, edges such as cheekbones, eyes, and it was also trained to detect change of colors, basically a method to break down a painting or an image into its constituent elements. But the challenge here was to make a painting which was not so different that it would be considered completely abstract and yet make a painting which is not so close to the original paintings that it starts to be considered as a fake or a copy. So the computer scientists needed to find a sweet spot between the two, not too abstract, not too similar, find the sweet spot between the two. Now the equation they used to optimize that, that question between abstraction and uh, replica was solved uh, by this equation, which they've used as the signature on the painting quite cheekily. Uh, they didn't add the name of a four artist. Instead, they directly used that particular equation as the signature of the painting. Now, this uh, piqued the interest of uh, architects and designers and artists all across the world. And very soon, a whole bunch of uh, examples started to pop up, uh, which is typically known as style transfer. Um, in style transfer, we use an example image of a style. For example, over here, the oil painting uh, on the right. And the style of that image is projected onto another image. This other image, which is the solid gray hatch in this example, the other image quite literally provides the geometry or the structure on which the style is projected on. And this large square is the result that we get if we sort of perform this exercise. Now this, this kind of became uh, quite popular in 2019 and 2020, and is still used as the introductory example to the use of AI for, for new students or researchers, because it's pre, it uses a pre-trained neural network. We don't have to train a neural network and the, the result is pretty instantaneous. So psychologically, the reward time is pretty low. So people tend to get more invested now. Such examples or such techniques can also be used to interbreed styles of uh, different architectural illustrations. This is an example of uh, 
interbreeding plants of different styles, as you can see, circular in one example and quite uh, box-like or orthogonal in the other. And the two can be interbred to give output as shown on the right side of the slide. Now, if we fix, uh, talking about this particular example, I won't get into details because this is not the focus of our workshop. If we simply stick to just one content image, which is basically the target geometry and vary the style images, as you can see, the algorithm is pretty good at detecting stylistic features from style images. And then of course, modifying the content image accordingly. As you can see from the chapel, it picks up the thick oblong walls. And from the orthogonal plan, it picks up the presence of box-like and straight lines. And that is how the plan has been modified. And from this typical Palladian villa, somehow it understands that the steps that lead to the interior happen to be one of the uh, visual features of such a plan. And it has kind of mimicked placing those steps around the circular spaces. <clears throat> And of course, if we keep the same style image and vary the content image just slightly, just if you vary the gradient, the, the direction of where the style is added, in which way it's added, in, in colloquial terms, the direction of the brush stroke changes with the change in direction of or the nature of gradient. And of course, uh, this process could be used to generate mood boards or conceptual diagrams. For example, if I was given this content image and I were asked to stylize the content image according to these three style images, I don't suppose given my skill set with different mediums of painting or sketching, I don't suppose I would be able to generate three outputs which would be better than these three. Keep in mind, each output takes about half an hour to generate. Uh, so, I mean, with not only in terms of speed, but also in terms of versatility, uh, the process can outtrump a human quite easily. And of course, it can be used to quickly visualize uh, black and white figure ground diagrams uh, in the style of, let's say, an example tile image. So, the fact that uh, the machine can pick these signature elements on its own is kind of both beautiful and also startling at the same time. Uh, and as you can see, it works across various scales from concept drawings to urban speculation, so on and so forth. Now, when I got into uh, the business of AI and architecture, I went sort of did a social experiment to actually try and understand what non-architects or non-designers think of the output. Uh, and I kind of randomly picked a painting from the internet and an image of a city in India. And I combined the two to get this output on the right. And I <clears throat> uploaded it on my uh, social media handle. And as it turns out, no one could kind of guess that this was indeed not painted by me. In fact, uh, one of my friends who herself happens to be an artist and quite good at that, in fact, went on to say that it's a gorgeous impasto work. Now, I, at the time, didn't know what impasto work is. I searched it and figured out that this is indeed the style of impasto work. So an artist herself is unable to recognize that uh, this has been generated by the computer and not by me. So how you want to read it is up to you. Is it a good thing? Is it a bad thing? Uh, what are the implications? Uh, each one has to make up his or, his or her own mind. Now, this was simply an example of images, uh, modification of pixels to uh, sort of generate different kinds of stylized output. Now, I'll just give you one more example of um, another kind of exercise that can be solved with AI, and then I'll jump into uh, 
our specific topic. Right. Um, this uh, presentation, this particular uh, PowerPoint is quite literally fresh out of the oven. Uh, this was developed by the participants uh, at CAD Futures and myself um, about three months back. Uh, we call the process deep isomer. The challenge we took up was that how do we generate variations of a 3D model or a 3D aggregate without mentioning explicit parametric rules? Now, even for people or designers who are really good at parametric tools, who are really good at defining algorithms, the moment within a project, the moment uh, the concept changes just slightly, you one often needs to completely edit the grasshopper script, right? Um, and needless to say, from one design or one project to the other, the script needs to be quite literally made from scratch in most of the cases. And also at the end of the day, uh, the percentage of architects all across the world who are good at using parametric tools and who want to use parametric tools, that percentage is in singular digits. And I'm not specifically talking about young graduates. When we talk about architects, we have to consider the whole spectrum of regions of the world and also the whole spectrum of age of uh, the different architects in the world. In this scenario, we wanted to develop an AI algorithm which would automatically learn the spatial distribution of the example model and then generate iterations on its own. Now, this is kind of pretty similar to uh, the phenomenon of isomerism in chemistry. Well, in real world, which is uh, uh, explained through the subject of chemistry, which you'll find in the example of carbon where Coal and diamond are two isomers of carbon, where the only difference is in, is in the way the atoms are physically connected to each other. There's not much chemical difference, so to speak, but just the way they're arranged is different, uh, which leads to the phenomenon of isomerism. And this question is pretty similar to that, wherein if you have an example, let's if you have coal, how do we understand its constituent atom, or in this case, its constituent walls, roof, etc., and generate something which is similar to it, which is diamond, with the same constituents, but arranged in a different manner. So we ended up calling the process deep isomerism. And the idea, as I've said, is to learn the implicit spatial feature or the distribution of, of, of built mass in the example model and give out iterations or variations of that. Now, there are, there are algorithms already out there called auto regression algorithms, which do this for images. What they do is that uh, auto regression algorithms read each pixel value of an example image and kind of appropriate a uh, probability distribution of all the pixel values. And of course, the more iterations you let it run, the closer the pixel distribution probability will be to reality. And once it learns this uh, probability distribution of pixel values for a given image, it can then generate new images, which are which use the same constituent elements, but they look different. In other words, if we talk in terms of architecture, we're using the same kind of walls, but they're arranged in a different manner. So it, it's not literally the same, but it's quite similar because it's using the same constant walls. If there were two walls, then two walls would be used. Um, but the problem was that, again, it worked in pixels. There was no way, no direct way for us to represent 3D geometry, 
uh, in this particular algorithm. So we kind of had to undertake a workaround where we started to represent 3D geometry in terms of 2D images. Now, because the neural network of autoregression was already available, our challenge was to convert the 3D geometry into corresponding image. And once autoregression is done, convert the output images back to 3D geometry with the information of the initial set of walls and roofs and platforms, et cetera, et cetera. Just to give you an example, how can this be done? Uh, first of all, we overlay a grid or underlay a grid uh, on the 3D geometry. Of course, the number of uh, cells of the grid, the size of the cells of the grid, all of those are flexible. This is an illustrative example. And once the grid is underlaid, we can identify how many unique cells do we have in this geometrical system? For example, for the geometry on the left, the unique cells are on the right, which signifies something. Keep in mind that if we repeat all these unique cells in a certain manner, then this geometry would be arrived at. If we repeat them with a different percentage distribution and also at different locations or we place them differently. In both the cases, we will not arrive at the same geometry, but there will be certain resemblance between this geometry and the other. And that is basically at the heart of this exercise. Now, once we identify the unique cells, then we kind of mark which cell has which unique identifier. For example, this bottom left is all zero because there's no geometry over here. If you notice this wall, which goes from the left to the right all throughout, you'll find these numbers, 199, 199, 199, repeated all across. Now, just as an example, for this wall, the first value is 163, whereas the second value is 199. Why is that? If you look close enough, you notice that the wall goes only half the way at the cell at the edge, whereas for the rest, it goes through and through. Which means that the cell at the edge is different from the cells that constitute the rest of the wall. So again, we're talking about unique cells. So the reduction of surface area, reduction of volume, Etc. and etc. All these factors yield a different unique cell. And this image on the right is the image representation or the pixel representation of the geometry. Now, if you can start to correlate, so there are one, two, three, four, four uh, walls that go through and through, two in each direction. And over here as well, as you can see, the dark lines go through and through. And there are two in number. Now, certain Pixels are darker because in those pixels or in those corresponding cells, the surface area or the volume of the geometry is higher. So it's kind of all correlated. And once we feed this image of the 3D geometry into autoregressive algorithm, uh, we end up, we start to get these variations where, as you can see in certain examples, uh, it is able to pick the idea of continuous lines in certain examples, it doesn't work so well. We sort of start to get this uh, tilized patch, which of course would lead to gibberish, et cetera, and et cetera. Now, again, sticking to the same example of the 3D geometry, uh, at the end of thousand iterations, the kind of output we were getting is shown in this video on the right. A lot of it is indeed gibberish because the alignment of the individual cells is not perfectly done. However, you can start to see certain patterns emerging. Certain walls are continuous. So at this point, it is able to learn that there are certain patches where the alignment of the unique cells need to be right next to each other. They cannot be a 90 degree rotation. And in certain cases, the ground level platforms 
start to become continuous, but yet it has holes uh, and all of these options could quite literally, literally be called gibberish, even though there's a hint of promise in, in, in there. If we increase the number of iterations to 10,000 from 1,000, then we start to get absolutely clean isomers or variations. And if you count the number of walls, you'll find that the number of walls remains the same. Keep in mind, we didn't explicitly mention that there are two continuous walls in one direction, two continuous walls in the other direction. We didn't explicitly mention that wherever we have a roof, it needs to be watertight to the walls around it. We didn't mention that wherever there's a platform or if indeed you're adding a platform, it needs to be watertight to the walls around it. None of that information was added. It learned it from the spatial distribution after the geometry was represented as an image. And then it auto-regressed new images, which were then converted into 3D geometry. And we started getting this clean, beautiful set of variations. We've just started exploration of this process. So we haven't um, undertaken any examples of geometries which are not orthogonal in nature. Uh, that's a whole different ball game and a whole different challenge. But while we stick to orthogonal shapes, uh, multiple geometries could also be used as input, which would mean that multiple images would need to be generated each geometry would be converted to a different image and the spatial, not spatial, sorry, from the images, the pixel distributions of each of those images will be learned and the output that we'll get will kind of be an interpolation between all of these. So if certain orthogonal aggregates have a certain specific geometrical signature and another set has a different set of signature elements, we'll kind of get output which would incorporate a bit of the both. And the, the aim with this process is to eventually, once we also cover non-orthogonal shapes and we get it to work with those, is to have a clickable plugin where all you need to do is to model a clean, simple, low polygonal, low density model as an example of which you want to generate iterations or variations. And you feed that into the plugin and the rest will be computed and you'll get a whole bunch of uh, variations as an output. So for the user who is not really well equipped with parametric software or isn't interested, because keep in mind, uh, not everyone likes to use parametric tools, right? So if we, again, if we talk about the whole community of designers, having such a one-click uh, plugin, in my opinion, would be really beneficial for people who are not naturally inclined towards computation or not naturally inclined towards the use of parametric tools. So as I said, the trick in this case was to efficiently convert the 3D geometry into its image representation without losing information on how space is divided or how spatial feature is distributed in the 3D geometry. I mean, we couldn't just have taken a screenshot of an isometric view or a, or a perspective view and just went ahead with it. That wouldn't give us the 3D information to take the output and stitch back a, a, a 3D model. That's, this is the way that it can be solved, or at least one of the ways in which it can be solved and the rest need to be explored. Right, uh, lastly, I would give an, I would talk about uh, the example that I briefly mentioned. Uh, which is pretty similar to the ex exercise that we will undertake. Um, before I get into that, just to clarify, because I, 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 in the Google form, I noticed that a couple of you have mentioned that uh, you don't have much idea about the use of AI or where AI is used. So for, for the sake of your understanding, I want to sort of 
compare traditional program with neural networks or AI. And many of you must have seen this uh, image or this ideation. Uh, in traditional programs, or, or let's say in Grasshopper scripts, we define the rules, the algorithm is known, whichever phenomenon or whichever process we are trying to automate is known, it's crystal clear, it's not a black box. So we, someone or a, or a bunch of people define the explicit rules in terms of coding. And then at the end, you feed the data, which is basically input data. And the traditional program will give you the answers or the output. Now, answers could be a whole bunch of numbers, it could be geometry, it could be image, et cetera, and et cetera. The data form or the data type is not important. AI is used in cases where the process is not clear. We don't know how a set of input values or input data leads to a certain set of output values or output data. We don't know the process. The process is a black box. However, we have a whole lot of examples. And by examples, I mean through observation or empirical analysis, we have a whole list of input values and output values. And it, what AI does is that it quite literally maps how those input values can lead to certain output values, which also we feed as example, and kind of appropriates that black box space, which we, through empirical analysis, are unable to uh, figure out or, 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 to, or to express it in an articulate manner so that computer scientists would be able to encode it in an automated solution. Now, I'll give you an example from the architecture uh, process. Uh, all of us, I'm pretty sure, have worked on daylight simulation at some point uh, in our career or in our studies. This is an example of a traditional program because uh, the complicated uh, algorithms or the formula that go behind daylight simulation have been understood or have been arrived at through empirical analysis of the observed data um, within buildings. Which is why when we run a simulation of daylight, we don't need example data. We just need to feed the input values. What is the geometry? What is the finish of the geometrical parts? What is the location? And of course, what is the time and the period of simulation? And through the process or through the algorithm, which is already defined, we get a grid of lux values, which kind of tells us the daylight level of that particular space. Now, in this equation, where could AI be used? I mean, we already have the formula for daylight simulation. Of course, we're not going to use AI for that because that will be an overkill because we don't need that. What ends up happening is that no matter how close the construction is to the specifications in the drawings, there's always a certain difference. There's always a certain delta between the simulated and predicted daylight levels, predicted through different complicated software, and the actual observed daylight level at the site post construction. There's always a certain delta. Now, we are yet to empirically understand and observe. In fact, forget about empirical detection. We are yet to, as a fraternity, compile a data set which would be used to empirically understand the correlation between the simulated value and the observed value. In the absence of that, uh, the use of AI could be pretty useful because we don't know why or when or at which place by which amount the difference between simulated value and the observed value would be high or low. So if we end up collecting a whole bunch of uh, observed data and the simulated predict, predicted data of 
the same site or the same project before someone takes the trouble of extracting empirical formula out of that ai can be used to kind of appropriate this or to predict how much of delta we'll have between the simulated value and the absolute value so as, as a thumb rule when we know the process there's no point in using ai uh, ai is only used in the cases where we don't know the process and we need to understand um, not understand, we need to predict uh, output of new data points. Now, our workshop is about urban beauty, and we will talk about how the qualitative aspect of urban beauty can be translated into quantitative numbers. And of course, then we're going to use those numbers to train a neural network to predict the urban beauty of new cityscapes or new images. Something similar as I've told, how we've done with the idea of urban safety. And uh, what we realized was that whenever we talk about uh, urban safety, and this is true for urban beauty as well, uh, whatever I'm going to say about urban safety right now will be true about urban beauty as well, except for the final result or, or the matrices or factors that will need to be figured out with more research but the idea the presenting idea would be the same now what ends up happening is that uh, whenever we talk about safety in particular we, we discuss a lot of active measures which would be increased police patrolling a faster complaint or grievance redressal system uh, and then there are certain long-term plans, and rightfully so, which would include educating children in school about um, gender sensitivity, et cetera, and et cetera. Now, often what is overlooked is the idea, or not idea, the fact that it is urban scape or the cityscape, which quite literally provides the canvas on which all the interactions happen. Most of the interactions are positive, some of them are neutral and unfortunately a certain percentage would be negative in nature however regardless of which kind of interaction you're having all of those interactions as i said happen quite literally on the canvas that is painted by cities and if you come to think about it each person would feel different if let's say if you're dropped in the middle of a highway how safe you'd feel would be different compared to let's say if you were dropped in the in front of a shopping mall or, or you were dropped right in front of a railway station how you how you perceive safety would be completely different and something similar of course happens with how we look at beauty in cities as well uh, if you go to different parts of cities um, how we perceive beauty of that particular cityscape would be different. And not only will it be different from one place to the other, but if you change the subject, instead of me, if one of you is put in the place, the kind of safety that I'll perceive or, or the kind of beauty that I'll perceive will be completely different compared to the kind of safety or beauty that you would perceive. Now, there are many different ways of dividing classes or groups of subjects. In the case of urban safety, because in India, there's a lopsided violence against women, we decided to club them as men and women, and to kind of find correlation between just by default, how unsafe women look, feel in cities, even if there's no negative uh, experience just by virtue of how you walk through the city what could be the correlation in terms of beauty one could say that we could divide it between designers and non-designers are designers really able to predict or understand or, or appreciate cities the same way that non-designers do are we too sensitive towards beauty are we less sensitive towards beauty compared to non-designers I don't know the answer to that. That could be one probable way of classifying uh, the case of urban beauty. Now, if we talk about 
seeing or looking or experiencing a cityscape from a distance, as in you look towards a certain direction and you see a vista or a whole bunch of buildings, etc., and etc. Research uh, says that there are four different things at play when we observe a cityscape or when we quite literally look out of the window in a city. Number one is compositional segregation, which is to say that our brain automatically segregates what we're seeing into, let's say, on the left, I see built mass, on the right, I see trees, in between, up top, I see sky, and then in between, down below, I see a road with vehicles on it. So step one is that, not step one, one of the processes is that no one knows if it's sequential or simultaneous. So one of the processes is that we tend to segregate the composition that we're seeing into different types. The other is, and this is more specific to objects that are moving, that are mobile, is that we tend to count uh, the number of mobile objects if we are right next to a road. We tend to observe how many vehicles are on the road. And even if we don't literally count as in one, two, three, four, five vehicles, no. Even if we don't literally do that, we kind of tend to have an understanding of is this road full of vehicles or does this road have one or two vehicles so I can probably cross the road. So we kind of have that kind of computation going on in the back of our heads uh, simultaneously uh, or as we observe outside. And not only vehicles, it also happens with uh, humans. When we look outside instantaneously without even thinking about it, we detect if, the, if a place is crowded, if a place is empty, so on and so forth. So it's not just segregating people or vehicles, but also what number of vehicles? Is it too many vehicles, too less, or what number of people are there? Is it too crowded? Is it not crowded? That kind of fine-tuned differentiation is also executed by the brain. The third is color. Uh, pretty self-explanatory. I don't need to talk about this more. Um, certain finishes of buildings signify different uh, feelings or, or poke different feelings in our experience. For example, if you go to an industrial belt of the town, the kind of colors you'll see would be different compared to, let's say, if you go to a part of the town which has more parks than other parts of the town. So, And color also signifies a temporal nature of cities. Uh, brightness signifies abundance of sunlight, gloominess, which is basically re reduction of brightness and saturation signifies uh, probably rainy weather or cloudy weather. And of course, as you dim the colors even more, it could either signify moving towards the night or if it's dimmed well below enough, then it literally signifies night. If you see certain patches of yellow or white with other parts being dark, then quite literally it signifies night. So color also plays not, not a role in how we read cityscapes, not only in terms of how we read which area it is, but also what time of the day it is. That would also play a role in how beautiful or how safe we find a place to be. The last is spatial semantics, which in simplified words means when we look at a building, which kind of building it is. Is it a marketplace? Is it a hospital? Now, we, given our lived experience uh, thus far, we don't literally need to sit and think these things, right? These come naturally to us. However, this information is this information is very crucial in terms of how we may see the cityscape, how beautiful we may find it, or how safe we may find it. For example, if you just stick to the example of buildings, uh, let's say uh, for religious people, arguably, if the spatial semantic tells them 
that here's a bunch of religious buildings, more particularly of the religion that they have faith in, probably they'll feel safer. Uh, given the world politics, if uh, it's of a religion that they don't look at kindly, probably they will feel unsafe. Um, so on and so forth. There could be many examples. Uh, if someone uh, looks at um, looks outside and recognizes that it's it's a whole bunch of industrial buildings, uh, also at the same time through object count notices that there aren't enough people around there, probably one may not want to venture out all alone in that part of the town. So these four in conjunction quite literally tell our brain information about a certain cityscape or, or a certain urban scape and then we start to feel certain things or we start to make calculations of how we want to navigate that space. Now to give you examples, compositional segregation is quite literally image segmentation where we sort of look at different patches of uh, different object types. Now I'll talk about uh, image segmentation briefly later as well when we uh, go through the script that takes care of it. Second example is object count, as I said. So not only do we sort of see which objects are people, but we also tend to count or try and have an understanding of how many people, if not in numbers, as I said, is it a lot of people or is it less number of people, et cetera, et cetera. Also keep in mind, if this human, if let's say, which I would assume is a man, but I can't be sure, of course, if this human was right in front of the camera, then the patch that would have been occupied by that human would have been much large. But in reality, in our experience, we would have known that even if this person is right in front of me, it's only one person. Just because that object or that person is occupying a whole lot of my viewing angle doesn't mean that there are a lot of people. That information is missing when you only segregate an image into constituent objects because it only tells us the percentage of pixels belonging to that criteria. That fine tuning or, or that nuance can only be added with object count. And as I said, more often than not, it's used on mobile objects and not stationary objects. Of course, then there's color depending on uh, the input image, the dominant color that is picked from that image changes. Now, there's a whole different argument on how many colors are we to pick? Are we to pick one major color per image? Are we to pick four different colors per image, et cetera, and et cetera. I'll talk about those solutions to such questions when we, uh, tomorrow, when we explicitly work with the data set and get into a neural network, I'll talk about correlations and that is when you'll be able to appreciate uh, selection of the number of colors. Uh, lastly, as I said, uh, would be spatial semantics. And there are AI algorithms, which when you feed an image into, will detect what do we see in those images. For example, if you look at the, if you look at the first phrase of places 365 categories, the first phrase of each of the images, you'd find that it's pretty accurate. Now, what we are going to do is that uh, we are going to have a detailed exercise on compositional segregation, which is basically image segmentation. Along with that, I will introduce the scripts of object count and color detection, but we won't include those in our exercise or in, in the training of neural network. We'll only restrict the number of input to image segmentation or compositional segregation. Now, spatial semantics requires a whole different set of installations, whole different set of uh, concepts. So we're going to skip that. We're not going to work on that. Uh, also, one may ask, why are we skipping object count and color if we are you know, having a hands-on example anyway? 
the answer to that is given that we are less in number, the number of images that we'd be able to rate will be limited. And with less number of rows of data, we can't increase the columns so much. We can't have 30 variables and only let's say 100 rows of data. As a thumb rule for each new variable, one needs at least, at least 30 new rows of data. And that's the bare minimum for academic purposes, that too, the bare minimum. If you talk about professional deployment, it's not 30, it could be a million, if not more for each variable. Right, so to end, uh, we have developed Safe or Not, which uh, predicts the safety of cityscapes. And we used uh, 10,000 images and we got them uh, rated by men and women. We are right now uh, working hands-on with the transgender community because of course they also need to be represented in this conversation. And what we ended up learning from the primary correlations was that uh, the presence of sidewalk, sky, and traffic signals made people feel secure about a space. And on the other hand, the presence of motorcycles, surprisingly enough, made people feel the most unsafe. I mean, that talks a lot about the notoriety of uh, motorcycle riders in India or the unsafe way in which they ride their motorcycles in India. Right, so if I talk about the method, uh, step number one is of course to collect a whole bunch of images which need to be rated by volunteers in, in the real world example that I'm talking about right now. In our case, we are the volunteers. Um, now, of course, image collection, if you have to collect 10,000 images, it would be a pain in the ass to sit and download those images one by one, right? So even that needs to be automated. And we'll have that as a hands-on exercise as well, which where we'll use Flickr API to automate downloading of images based on certain search words or certain search phrases. Part number two would be the feature extraction or the input variables or input data, which we are going to get using uh, the algorithm for compositional segregation, which is basically image segmentation. And I'll talk about what are the output types when we get to that. The third would be the output data collection, which is basically the crowdsourced evaluation. And as I said, we are the crowd right now. So we will be rating a whole bunch of images. The fourth step is training a neural network with the extracted features of the images. In other words, the input values and the output values, which should be the crowdsourced evaluation or the average of how safe or how beautiful an image is. And lastly, once the neural network training is done, then any new image could be used or could be uploaded uh, into the neural network. And uh, the subjective evaluation will be predicted. Now, the process that we're going to undertake is, of course, not restricted to safety or beauty. The moment you change uh, what you're asking people to review in step number three, which is crowdsourced evaluation, the process takes a whole different meaning, right? Instead of beauty or safety, if you ask someone to rate aliveness, if you ask someone to rate um, how traditional or how modern an image looks, that could also give different insights in how we experience the city as we go through the city. So the moment you change that uh, phrase against which you're asking people to judge images, the nature of the uh, process or the output of the research completely changes just by that phrase. And there are certain takeaways from the male versus female scores of safe or not. I won't get into the, into the details, but uh, on average, uh, the safety score 
by men was 27.74% higher than the safety score by women. And in as many as 92% of the cases, uh, men's, uh, this is mistyped, uh, men's uh, safety score was higher than women's safety score. And as I said, we're working with the trans community right now. So we'll include that uh, here as well, once we're done. So what's going to happen is that, uh, again, just the way it happened with safety scores and beauty scores as well, if someone does end up undertaking the research in a large scale, for each des design proposal, each spot would have a different beauty sensation, will have a different beauty score. And not just that, when you're collecting data or when you're getting images rated, if you add a field for, if you add a field for a city, which city does that person live in? If you add a field of profession, if you add a field of age, then for each of those fields, you'll have different kind of beauty score, which is pretty obvious, but the moment you add a new field or the moment you add a new column in the process, the number of rows you need to add increases exponentially. So people tend to uh, people tend to uh, restrict that. So for example, if you pick any random image of a city, uh, the av the average beauty score of that image in New York or the score by people of New York would be different. People of for people of London, the average beauty score would be different. For people of let's say New Delhi in India, the average beauty score would be different. And for people of uh, Rio de Janeiro, it would be different uh, compared to other cities in Brazil itself. Uh, so there's no one unique answer. There's no one unique value. How intricate or how nuanced would the output be? That would uh, as one can guess it depends on how intricate or how many columns or how many fields we incorporate at the data collection phase. So what is envisaged out of this process is that urban design proposals, one is that one can always run audits of cities. So if you either use Google map to extract images of different neighborhoods with the trained neural network you can you can generate audits of how safe a neighborhood is or how beautiful a neighborhood is and for patches which are unsafe and for patches which are not labeled as beautiful those could be separately addressed that's use number one uh, that's a direct use of such a process but the larger implication in the process of design would be that when designs of urban scale would be undertaken, when interventions would be designed or proposed, the residents of that neighborhood would be given an app and they'd be asked to, let's say, click or upload images which they find to be beautiful or, or neighborhoods which they find to be beautiful or, or click and upload stuff that you want to be built in your neighborhood. And at the same time, click or upload stuff that you don't want to be built in your neighborhood, that you don't find beautiful or that you don't find safe. And with that data itself, with enough number of residents of that neighborhood uploading enough such images with the tags, of course, there would be data to be crunched. And right at the beginning of the design process, the designer or the designers would have a fair amount of idea about the visual sensibilities of the people of that neighborhood. So the participatory nature of urban design or design proposal of the city level uh, would be increased. Right now, designers tend to go ahead with two or three proposals and then different stakeholders are invited to give their opinion and then there's a back and forth process. But if such an app is indeed developed, and I'm pretty sure it will be eventually, 
uh, it would be a departure from the top-down guideline producing method that are used by us right now. We tend to tell people what is good or what is bad in most of the cases. And that, that the power will quite literally go to the people. The power will literally be crowdsourced. And it makes sense because between different cities, what the people like or dislike is different. And forget different cities, even within a city for different neighborhoods, the sensibilities of the people living there vary from one area to the other. And if we are to be true to our profession, then it would be prudent to quantify that sensibility and take that information in our design process. Right, so that kind of concludes the presentation. If you have any questions, kindly unmute yourself and uh, we can have a discussion. Uh, what I, uh, okay. first of all, I hope you guys are able to access uh, the Google Drive folder that I've shared with you. Uh, you may have noticed that there are two folders at this moment, one called Colab Files, the other called Images for Ratings. Uh, the files that you see in the folder called Colab Files are basically the Google Colab files that we are going to use. Kindly download them locally, and then we're going to upload them on our individual um, Google Colab accounts. Uh, we're not going to connect this Google Drive folder to our corresponding accounts because there are multiple of us that connection won't happen properly. Uh, there are four uh, files in the Colab files folder at the moment. Kindly download all of them. I will download, a, sorry, I will upload a fifth file before the beginning of our session tomorrow, which we will use to train a neural network. And I would take a 10 minute break before we resume. But before that, let me share the link with you. The way to uh, access uh, Flickr API is, of course, to first of all uh, apply for the API. And I'm sharing the link with you in the chat window. Uh, kindly go to this link. Uh, what you'll find is this is where. They ask you only two questions. Number one, what is the name of your app? You could type uh, beauty detection. What are you building? Just add one or two lines. You could copy paste uh, the description of the workshop or probably copy paste a couple of lines from there, except these two. And they instantaneously give you the API key and the secret key. We will need those, we will need those credentials to run the script that will make Google Colab talk to the Flickr database and then extract images from the Flickr database. So kindly write these two down and get your credentials in the next 10 minutes or so. And I'll be back in exactly 10 minutes. Now I see that someone has typed a question. Uh, we are only going to use my name. Uh, we will, uh, I will, uh, share the script and also demonstrate how to use object detection and how to use color detection. Spatial semantics, I will give you the link to the research paper or I could share the paper and you'll have to look that up. Again, it's open source, it's developed by MIT. You can, once you work on Google Colab enough number of times, you can get it to work. Just because, number one, we don't have enough time to cover all of them. And number two, there are some 13 of us, out of which seven are present at the moment. So we can't literally read those many images to include those many variables in, in training the neural network. We can't have 
20 variables and only five rows of data, right? So there needs to be a proportion in, in that as well, which is why we're not including that. Uh, but we'll go through object detection and color detection as well. But just because the number of variables need to be restricted, we'll only stick to semantic segmentation while training the neural network. Later on, you can always include more variables uh, with the process. Right. All right. So I'll take 10 minutes break and I'll be back. See you guys.
All right, uh, let's head over to Google Colab to start with the first script, which is this one, Flickr underscore API underscore download. As I said, uh, download them locally because we will need to upload these one by one to our uh, Google Colab file or, or window. So I'm going to go to Google Colab. <clears throat> okay, there are two ways to upload a file from the local disk space. One is when this pop-up window gets shown right at the beginning, you can click on upload and then choose the file that needs to be uploaded. Alternatively, just in case you've closed that window, you can go to file and click on upload notebook. And then choose the particular now, uh, <clears throat> As uh, mentioned in the form that had, I had shared with you, some of you have not used Google Colab before. Uh, let me talk about it briefly. Uh, what Google Colab does, first of all, Google Colab is built with the programming language Python. And what Colab does is that it lets us type Python code in our browser, which means that we don't need to install a software to execute Python. And secondly, Colab by default uh, allocates free GPUs from the Google server for the script to be executed. Now, there are now this Flickr download API is a pretty straightforward script where it has gets access to the Flickr database and then it downloads uh, a certain set of images. But in the other scripts, uh, since it uses AI, the execution of AI scripts would take significantly longer if they are locally executed in our laptops or in our workstations. The GPUs allocated to us through Google Colab are by default uh, better specified than the GPUs that are available uh, in our laptops and in our workstations. So the process becomes faster. And of course, it's also hassle-free, wherein we don't need to install another software. Uh, as far as the interface is concerned, uh, Colab lets us write certain texts, which could be considered as instructions or descriptions of what's happening. So this patch, for example, right at the top is a text and the gray boxes on which if you hover your mouse, you'll start seeing this play button on the left. These gray boxes are pieces of code. We'll run them one by one and the rest with white background are basically texts which either give us instructions or tell us what the next piece of code is all about. Right, so as it says, step number one is to import uh, different libraries that would be used to download the images. And uh, step number one, or the first piece of the code will also connect us to the Flickr API. Now, one of the conventions of writing neat code is to add certain comments as written here after the hash. 
when you type a hash in Python, it means that you're basically writing descriptive text and it's not an executive, executable line of code. And as it says here, it asks us to paste our key and secret within these single quotes. I am going to go ahead and do that. And if you guys have uh, gone to that link and uh, put in the details, you would have received something like this as well. You'll get a string which represents the key and you'll get another string that represents the secret. Now, again, just in case you ran into any trouble getting that generated, uh, let me paste these for you. For the time being, you could use mine, uh, but I would request you not to keep using them. This was the key, and this is the secret. I'm going to go to <clears throat> collab and paste the two. So first goes secret, and they need to be pasted within the single quotes. Single quotes. Uh, basically tell Python that this is a string, which is a data type, as we know. Uh, without the single quotes, it would be considered as a direct input or a direct number, which will run us into errors because, of course, the string contains alphabets as well as numbers. And we've got to paste the key. All right. So. On pasting the key and the secret, the connection to the API would be made, but there still remains an unanswered question, which is where would the images be saved? Now, Colab doesn't have direct access to the local disk space. And it could be given access to the local disk space, but usually uh, what we end up doing is saving the images in our corresponding Google Drive folder. So if you are running, so for example, I'm running it on this particular account, the images will be saved in the corresponding Google Drive of this account. And as you are using different accounts, the images would be saved in those corresponding Google Drive folders. Colab would also need permission to access uh, your corresponding Google Drive folders. Even though Colab and Drive are both made by Google, for safety reasons, Google does ask us to give authentication for the use of Google Drive as well. So once we execute this piece of code, that process will also be demonstrated. The way to execute this piece of code is pretty simple. We simply click on the play button. And as it processes this piece of code, uh, you'll see the output being displayed in a smaller window at the bottom. And for those who haven't used uh, Colab before, uh, you'll notice that once this piece of code is run, or rather once a piece of code is run for the first time in a Google Colab file, the top of your screen would say that it's connected. And once it says it's connected with a green tick mark, it will also show you the RAM space and disk space that have been virtually allocated to you. Now, as you can see, it says, permit this notebook to access your Google Drive files. Simply click on connect to Google Drive, select the account that is being used and then you allow permission. Right, and once uh, the code is executed, it will tell us 
the last line would be the last output line would be mounted at content under sorry slash tribe which basically means that your particular tribe and the account that you clicked on in the pop-up window has been mounted or has been connected to this collab file now i'll give you guys five minutes to get this to work in case anyone is facing any trouble in getting the connection done or copy pasting the key and the secret kindly unmute yourself or alternatively if it's done either through the chat window or by unmuting yourself let me know i'll move on to the next uh, bit of the code Great. Uh, I'm going to go to the next step of the code, which is uh, basically uh, what sort of keywords we use to search images and the number of images that uh, Google Colab is going to go through. And those two are controlled by quite literally the first two lines of this piece of the code. In that, you could use any phrase you want. It need not be related to street. Uh, let's say I type Los Angeles street. And for a number of results, uh, I keep it at 100 because we're just demonstrating the process. We don't need to download 10,000 images. Nor do I think Flickr would have 10,000 images for Los Angeles. Uh, also, in the text, it tells us that for about 100 images, it takes around 30 seconds to execute. So within the single quotes, I've changed the name to Los Angeles. And I let the number of results be 100. Not really worried about that. And I'll run this piece of the code. Right, so <clears throat> the code has been executed and it says that out of 174 files have been saved and 26 files have been skipped. In this piece of the code, uh, images that are portrait in orientation or images that are square, in other words, images that are not in the landscape orientation are skipped. Uh, the reason is the code was developed to download cityscape images. And of course, when we experience a city, the way our view viewing angle works is that we experience a city or experience life, so to speak, uh, for that matter, uh, in the landscape orientation. We don't really see in the portrait orientation or in one is to one aspect ratio. So those files tend to be skipped. Also, certain images in Flickr are pretty low resolution. Those files are also skipped. So if you have any of those two conditions, those files would be skipped. And now if we go to our Google Drive, uh, for example, over here, if I refresh it, then I'll find that folder has been added into Google Drive. And of course, if I double click into it, uh, I can then see the images have been saved. 
which basically means you can quite literally use this code to download images with any key phrase or any search phrase, need not be street, need not be a city, could be any topic. And the code automatically adds numbers to the images so that they kind of get saved in a serial order. Right, I hope this is working for you guys. All right, great, Matthias. <clears throat> if at all, I don't suppose one should face any trouble with this because this is a pretty straightforward execution, but if at all someone is facing any trouble, kindly let me know. I would have you share your screen and we can debug the problem in that case. All right, now for the demonstration of image segmentation and then later color detection and object detection, but primarily image segmentation to begin with. Uh, let's just use this folder that we have saved through Flickr. Now, there are certain images that I am going to delete, which don't make sense uh, when we talk about cityscapes from the perspective of humans. For example, I'm going to delete this because this is not only a bird's eye view, but this is also black and white. We're going to delete black and white images. We're going to delete uh, bird's eye view images or images that are not uh, clicked from the human perspective. This, secondly, we are going to delete images which are from the nighttime. Segmentation, detection, all of these algorithms have been predominantly developed with example images of the daytime. Their accuracies take a nosedive when we get into the realm of night images. So nighttime images would be deleted. And as I said, I'm going to also delete black and white images. So take a bit of time to go through your images and delete the ones. Uh, which don't satisfy those conditions. So black and white, nighttime, and images not from the regular human perspective. All right, once you clean your uh, folder, then we can move on to the image segmentation script and then discuss its result before we move on to the other two examples. And uh, you may need a bit of time to clean your folder. So let me just stop sharing for five minutes and we'll start. <clears throat>
<clears throat> All right, let's uh, move to emit segmentation. We are going to go back to our collab window, go to file, and again, go to upload notebook. And this time we are going to upload segmentation. Okay, uh, there are three blank code cells, which I, I guess I forgot to delete before uploading. Can you ignore these three? Um, as far as uh, the steps are concerned, <clears throat> in the first piece of the code, uh, we only need to worry about one particular line, which is the fourth line. And as you can see in the third line, there's an instruction written which says replace drive path here. Now, what does this mean in particular? If I go to uh, Google Drive, we'll see that this particular folder, of course, the name of the folder would be the same as the search phrase. For me, it was Los Angeles Street. This is nested within my drive, or this is a subfolder of my drive. Pretty similar to how these uh, how folders in our local disk space are nested within each other in, in a certain hierarchy. And if we click on the search bar, we see them written with backslashes. Uh, this, for example, is D drive within the research, safe or not. Similarly for this, it will be my drive slash Los Angeles street. And that is exactly how this is written. We, you can see my drive. Uh, at the time of writing this file, I was using a folder called AI, which was nested within my drive. I'm going to delete those two and type the name of the folder that is relevant to us. Remember, the name of the folder is case sensitive. If your search phrase had all lower cases, kindly type the same. And if it had a combination, type the same combination when you change the text after the slash. And that's about it. We run this piece of the code and Colab will establish connection to that particular uh, folder. And since this file is also uh, getting access to drive, it will again ask for permission to access Google Drive. Each time a new notebook, a notebook in this context is the collab file. Each time a new collab file wants to access your Google Drive, uh, collab will explicitly ask for permission. The step is the same. We click the account and then we scroll down to allow it to access the drive. So as you can imagine, the second uh, line of the code establishes the connection to drive. And the last line of the code establishes connection to a particular folder, which we have explicitly mentioned over here, which is, in my case, Los Angeles Street. Could be a different phrase uh, for you. So now at this moment, the connection to a particular folder has been established within Google Drive. The next step is this piece of the code through which uh, our collab file is going to read the images saved in the folder. We've established the connection to the folder. Now it needs to read the images. Once the images are read, then it will execute segmentation. Uh, let's run this piece of code. There's no uh, change that we need to execute for this piece of code. Uh, 
no matter which folder you're connecting, the second piece of the code uh, doesn't require any input, nor does the third piece of code. So basically in this Colab file, the only tinkering or editing that you need to make is the fourth line in the first piece of the code, which quite literally connects it to that particular folder. Now, once the second piece of the code has been executed, it tells us the number of files that are in the folder. And just as a safety measure, it also prints out the name of the images or the name of the files within that particular folder. This is just to make sure that the right folder has been connected. There might be cases where one may have similarly named folders, but one may have uppercase, one may have a number at the end and you may have missed it. So this is just to make sure that you have indeed connected to the right folder. Lastly, we go to the third piece of the code and the original file for this, the link to it is mentioned over here. When you go to this particular link, you'll notice that there's a whole lot of options. Uh, there's an option to execute image segmentation on videos as well. Uh, we don't need all those options. The idea is to simplify the codes to an extent where we can use it for the specific purpose of segmenting images, particularly cityscape images. So let me run this piece of the code as well. And I'll scroll down to show you the output as and how it gets displayed. What it will do is that it will tell you which image is being segmented at which particular moment. It'll go through the images one by one. There are about 50 odd images over here, which in my opinion is gonna take around 10 minutes. So let's give it the time. And while these are being segmented, uh, if we go back to our folder, we'll notice that the script has created a subfolder within this particular folder called segmentation. If you go to that subfolder, you'll see the segmented output being saved. Again, for our reference, just for us to see and correlate visually the original images and these images. For example, if you look at the seventh image, or the image named 007, this patch of sky in the middle and then few trees along the sidewalk. And if you correlate it to the seventh image, I'm pretty sure that is what you'll see. Yeah, few vehicles, few trees along the sidewalk and there's a patch of sky in the middle. So you can kind of correlate the output with uh, the images displayed here, or the images saved in your folder. And let's give it some time. Yeah, took about two minutes for 10 images. For 50 images, it's gonna take around uh, 10 minutes. Uh, is the execution working fine for your cases? Yeah, in my case, it, it is working. Oh, great. Wonderful. Can I ask a question? Sure. 
So each color refers to a specific class of object, right? Yeah. Um, so let's say cars, they are always this specific color on the outputs of this model? Yeah. So cars the, would be uh, in a specific column and all the output values would be percentage of total pixels occupied by that particular class. Okay, can you repeat the same the last sentence? Yeah. Each class will have the percentage of pixels occupied by that class in the image. Okay. If 20% this... of the image has vehicles, the output will be 20. Now, the 20 person may be occupied by one single car right in front of the camera, or it could be occupied by 10 different cars at a distance. Mm -hmm. so segmentation basically counts the overall distribution of the class. It doesn't tell us how many are there. And that missing information is to be added using object detection. Okay, and the objects that you are interested are listed on this Python code that we are using. That's right, yes. And at the end, it will also, like once it's done segmenting all the images uh, in the original folder in Google Drive, it will also save a CSV file with all the numbers tabulated. And what is the model that we are using? It was trained specifically on what data set? This model was developed under the leaders, leadership of Lex Friedman, who also happens to have a pretty interesting podcast on YouTube. Uh, okay. Yeah, uh, this was developed, I think if I'm not wrong, back in 2016 when self-driving vehicles were a research topic in MIT. And they clicked around 2000 images or they sourced 2000 images and used those 2000 images to develop the AI algorithm. Now, if I, conceptually speaking, let me tell you how uh, the algorithm was developed or what is the process of developing such an algorithm. So just let me just open an image and I'll talk about it. I am unable to find the ready-made picture. So let me conceptually demonstrate how it was developed uh, using Photoshop. Okay, the process is painful. 
because the input data set uh, for <coughs> uh, the algorithm was marked manually. So first of all, they decided the number of classes they wanted in accordance to or with respect to self-driving vehicles. So for example, let's talk about Sky because that's easy to distinguish. And what they ended up doing was they would manually uh, They would man. Oops. Hold on. Brush, brush, brush. I don't. Uh, the thing it. is, I think you're using an eraser. Can you should get the brush? Oh, sorry, I my bad. That's the my bad. Yes, yes, you're right. <laughs> right. Perfect. Yeah. Uh, so they would manually, let me reduce the opacity. Yeah, they would manually mark the portion which has sky. So they would skip this part and I'm doing a pretty rough and shabby job. Uh, they would draw polygons to mark that. So for example, this would be sky. And this patch as well. On this patch. Uh, and they would do the same on quite literally all the images. So you draw polylines to signify sky. Let me do that. Let me draw polylines. So for each of the 2000 images, for the bunch of uh, research associates that they had, the job for a whole semester was to draw this polyline and mark it as such. So that's just sky. Then they would move on to, let's say, which is the more difficult example, uh, humans. Uh, let me mark them with black. Now, someone would also sit down and mark the humans. Now, as you can imagine, uh, how do you mark the humans and to what extent of accuracy you mark the humans would be different from one person to the other. And because it was done in an institute, wasn't really as streamlined as you would expect it to be. Of course, the companies that have aced uh, self-driving vehicles do not really have them those algorithms as open source. So, Let's say this, and all of the classes would be marked like this. So humans here as well, and one could do the same for the people over here. And all of the classes would be marked with a different polygon. And the algorithm was trained to associate each of the polygons belonging to a certain class with the kind of pixels it was seeing in the images. The algorithm was trained to not only, of course, detect the pixels, which is pretty easy to do, but also to detect edges. As in, uh, if you're talking about poles, and if you only restrict to poles, there's no pole here. If you only restrict to this pole over here, the algorithm was able to correlate the hatch polygon of the pole with the fact that within the image, Poles are quite often represented by parallel lines. It could detect the edges. As far as humans are concerned, it could detect that the edge would be kind of circular at the top with a certain amorphous shape at the bottom, so on and so forth. So on one hand, the algorithm was automatically able to detect edges and recognize the shape of the edges. And on the, on the other hand, uh, which edges represent which classes, that information was fed through painstakingly labeling each of the 2000 images with such polygons. Uh, of course, with more images, higher would have been the accuracy, but this is the latest and, and the most prevalent uh, 
segmentation algorithm that's out there, or, or in other words, the easiest one that is out there. Uh, there are many others, uh, and different algorithms have different levels of accuracy. As the entry point into the segmentation space, in my opinion, this is the best algorithm to begin with because the number of controls are less. So you get used to the process, you get used to uh, seeing the classes, correlating them, kind of you start to value the idea of the process and then you train it in a, in a, you start to train a neural network, you get through that process a couple of times before you move on to uh, more complicated uh, algorithms for segmentation. Cool. Thank you. Yes, if so, this algorithm was developed predominantly with images from Northern America, which means that most of the images did not have a lot of visual noise, which is typical of countries that are not in North America and Europe. Uh, for example, in India, we have abundance of wires hanging across the street. We have, in many places, garbage littered uh, around the street. Those, so the algorithm, since those were not labeled in polygons in the image data set from North America, because you don't often see those in the cities of North America. If we execute this algorithm on such images from countries where we see that, uh, the accuracy will obviously reduce because inherently the algorithm is not trained to detect those edges and correlate them to a uh, specific polygon related to let's say garbage or related to wires. Uh, in that case, uh, it will appropriate it to the closest neighboring class, which basically means that one of the 20 classes would have additional pixel percentage assigned to it just because the algorithm doesn't know how to distinguish classes that have not been included in the image data set from North America. So yeah, if we have to develop it uh, from scratch, we need to label all of it. And uh, again, an easy example to start that process is by using an algorithm called pix to pix um, There's There was this thesis in Harvard GSD by Stanislas, not too sure how to pronounce his second name by Stanislas, who had used pix to pix to automate generation of floor plans. Yes, yeah, I'm again, sorry, uh, Stanislas is his second name. I'm not too sure how to pronounce his first name. Uh, anyway, you can Google his name and uh, pix to pix and you'll be able to connect the dots on how to train new models or, or images. Yes, there, there would be uh, certain cases. I'm, I'm pretty sure it has to do something to do with the wheels. Bicycles have wheels, uh, carts have wheels. And since it's not by default trained with uh, supermarket carts, it may end up recognizing it that, as a bicycle. So yes, there would be certain outlier cases which won't be recognized properly. and. Right now, uh, there is a certain chunk of a certain chunk of the discourse in the AI world, uh, not related to architecture, but AI in general, is indeed related to uh, how more data can be, how more data from non-West centric countries could be used, uh, and it's not only a question of intent just by virtue of where internet was developed, where connectivity, internet connectivity and data storage are cheaper, just by virtue of those logistical issues, you will end up seeing that, again, the Northern hemisphere, Western worlds have meticulously 
sieved a lot of data, which some of the other countries haven't. So if you want to develop stuff, if you want to develop AI on, let's say, Haiti, they don't have a legacy of storing data. It's just individual people saving whatever is then on their uh, desktops. They don't have the institutional legacy of saving data. So that's a problem that the entire community is trying to crack. And um, which also means if Tesla comes to India, for example, I am pretty sure uh, the self-driving mode will not be allowed in the highways of India as well, just because it's not used to detecting the signboards of India, the language of India. Uh, it's not used to detecting the kind of buildings we have in India that that are built along the highway, et cetera, and et cetera. So even from a company's perspective, each time, let's say, let's talk about Tesla. From Tesla's perspective, each time they go to a country which has a completely different visual palette, they would need to train their models with images and data from that particular country right from the scratch. Other, I mean, what they've done in the US will not be applicable in India, will not be, of course, applicable in Africa as well. All right, having said that, uh, because this run is complete, it says that feature extraction completed. And it also says that a CSV file has been created, which we will find in this uh, folder. The CSV file is not saved within segmentation. It's saved outside segmentation in the original folder. If I scroll down, <coughs> this is the CSV file that we will come across. Now, of course, the first column tabulates the name of the image. Uh, and the rest are basically the different classes. So for example, vegetation score of 17.5 means that 17.5% of the pixels of that particular image are assigned the class vegetation. Similarly, we have sky, person, rider, car, truck, bus, et cetera, and et cetera. There's a whole bunch of classes which you can go through later. I'm not going to spend time in talking about which classes are included. And there's one class right at the end called void, which is when it cannot detect a bunch of pixels to be worthy of being included in any of these um, classes, then it puts them in void class. Now, I have personally never come across any image whose any percentage of pixel has been put under the void class uh, because it kind of tends to find the nearest matching neighbor if it is not able to explicitly detect which class it should belong to and tends to assign those pixels to that particular class. Right, so if you notice here, uh, there's something called human score in column G. And there's something called person score in column S. Right, and human and person, those two words are synonymous. Now, again, like I said, with less number of rows of data, because collectively uh, six or seven of us will not be able to read as many images needed to include all of these columns. Now, as I said, the bare minimum thumb rule is for each new variable, we need 30 rows of data. Now with around 20 variables, we would have needed 20 into 30, 600 rows of data. Keep in mind, we can't directly rate 600 images and one rating per image to actually arrive at the score. There needs to be ideally at least, at least again, at the bare minimum, at least three ratings per image to kind of get a consensus on how safe or unsafe or how beautiful or 
not so beautiful that particular image is. We can't have one rating per image. Now, just by virtue of how many of us are present in the workshop and how many variables can be accommodated uh, in this particular script, what I've done is the first six columns, basically from build score to human score, in other words, from column B to G, these uh, are, do not represent the classes. The classes are actually from column H, that is the road score, all the way to white score. Now, these first six columns are a combination of the elaborate classes. For example, human score is basically a person score plus rider score. Rider is the person driving the motorcycle. So for example, here 5.1 plus, let me increase the size of this. 5.1 plus 0.02, that would be 5.12. And that is exactly what you'll see in human score. So that becomes 5.12. Uh, auto score would include car, truck, tram, et cetera, and et cetera. All of those are clubbed together. Uh, sidewalk score would include a side, uh, paved Sorry, paved score would include sidewalk and as well as uh, there are a couple of other uh, metal surface finishes. So those are combined in a way to, for us, for the sake of this exercise, to only have six variables, which we are going to work with. Again, with more rows of data, with more images, so let's say if this was a workshop with 100 participants, then we would have those many rows of data, then we would have been directly using all of these classes. Right now, the first six represent the rest of them, the original classes, but some of them are combined to yield certain scores. Uh, for example, build score includes uh, building score as well as uh, wall score and fence score. These three are added to give us build scores and so on and so forth. So, Again, for the sake of demonstration, we're going to pick data from column B to column G. But later on, with more uh, rows of data, or if you are taking this up later on your own accord, then you can use uh, the numbers from column H to the end, because those represent the true classes. From B to G are basically additions of similar classes. Right, and of course, you can directly go to a particular original class, look at the percentage value, go back to the image it belongs to, and you can start visually correlating that. The output that we've uh, arrived at is pretty accurate. All right, so that goes uh, image segmentation. Tomorrow, what we're going to do, uh, tomorrow we'll have a demonstration of object, sorry, object detection and color detection, both of which don't take much time, 10, 15 minutes each. And then we'll move on to training the neural network with this data set and the images that you would be rating between the end of today's session and the beginning of tomorrow's session. Um, and if we have time at the end of training the neural network, then I will also briefly talk about the, the concept that goes behind developing a neural network. What kind of functions work uh, in the background? What, what does iterations or epochs really mean? What does it signify in terms of learning the process? How, how do patterns get detected? I'll talk about it briefly as well. Now, uh, what I would request you to do as far as rating is concerned, um, the 
access the yeah there are two particular files uh, first is sorry there's a file and a folder first is called greetings if you open this sheet you notice that i have mentioned your names and i have mentioned the image number that you would be rating uh kindly do not download this locally because uh, in that case i would have to stitch different columns belonging to different participants separately and i don't suppose i'll have that time tomorrow within the three four hour time frame that we can have uh and in this folder called images for ratings the corresponding images are saved so for example uh let's say i'm anna and for image number one i'm going to open image number one and the options for me go from not for me in the same set of options for everyone but the options that i see are from extremely unbeautiful to extremely beautiful and everything in between so it goes from extremely unbeautiful very unbeautiful unbeautiful maybe unbeautiful unsure and then the other end of the spectrum there are certain things to keep in mind there's of course no correct answer whatever your gut feeling is you select that particular option. If you're unsure, then you're unsure. You select that. Uh, if you find another image to be extremely unbeautiful, you select that. And if you find one to be extremely beautiful, then you select that. There's, as I said, there's no right or wrong answer. Whatever your gut feeling is, uh, you pick that particular option. Now, I don't know how many of you would be able to do this, but if possible, it's not absolutely necessary, but if possible, if you can grab, if you can request a non-designer friend or a family member to take part in the process as well, then we'll be able to quantify the difference between how designers see cities in terms of beauty and how non-designers see cities in terms of beauty. If you can, uh, get your non-designer friend or family member to part, take part in, then that'll be, uh, then the kind of output we'll get will be really interesting to read. Again, the process is the same. Uh, the same set of image numbers for you. You could probably have that person do it along with you or have, have them seated next to you and then go through the images one by one together. Uh, the way I do it, because I've been, doing this for a while the way i do it and you can have your own process i tend to park this on the left and park the image on the right and i simply uh basically toggle through this as i go through my options or or as i pick the rating one by one that in my opinion this is the fastest way of getting it done now, I, I realized that getting non-designers to read within this short span of time might be difficult. So as I said, it's optional. Uh, you may skip it if you don't get time, but I would honestly request you to at least uh, complete the designer column of ratings under your name. There are only 50 images per uh, participant. And if we can get... Um, Quite a bunch of them rated, then our data set will have enough number of rows for us to then go on and train our neural network. Without enough number of rows, the data set will be too limited. Then I would have to download a data set that is already available on the internet. So something to do with housing rate or population increase and something completely unrelated to architecture or urban design, so to speak, or probably I'll have to use the one used for urban safety and demonstrate the rest of the process. Kindly spend some time, half an hour and an hour to rate them. And just because, just the way the number of images are divided for Louisa and for Matthias, 
there's a change of the image number as you scroll down in the midway mark. So for example, in the case of Matthias, it starts at 26, goes all the way to 50, then it starts at image number 326 and goes all the way to 350. So when this, when you see this change of image text highlighted in yellow, uh, kindly make sure that you've snapped out of this preview and you scroll to the image that is mentioned and then you kind of do the same again. Um, all right, so I, I guess that's about it as far as today's session is concerned. Um, if you have any questions, please, uh, I'm available for the next five or 10 minutes. And the uh, rest three, we are going to work on tomorrow. That is, as I said, uh, color detection image, uh, sorry, uh, object detection and training a neural network from scratch. So the neural network is going to be trained like with the image features we extracted on that CSV file. Is that it? Yeah. And if we use it like um, object detection model, we, we would add more lines into that CSV. Is that yeah. it? Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. Okay. Yes. So uh, object detection value will have a different kind of value. It will be, it will signify the number of items present. So the range will be different. The range for image segmentation will be different. So we go, so when we include a data set of inherently different range or ranges, so to speak, then we have to normalize the data as well. Uh, which basically means if for percentage, it goes from zero to hundred and for numbers, if the minimum is zero and maximum is let's say 50, then we have to extrapolate the zero to 50 to zero to hundred, just to give equal weightages to the different columns or alternatively reduce the uh, percentage pixels from zero to hundred to zero to 50, just to give Otherwise, with different ranges, uh, neural network can tend to have, tend to give different weightages to different variables. We don't want that initial bias in the process. So as, as a thumb rule, certain people tend to normalize everything from zero to one, regardless of which range you're talking about, or zero to hundred or whichever matrix that you want to stick to. And after the workshop, if I want to use like this model, on a data set of my city, for example, will I be able to do it? Yeah, of course, you'll be able to do it. Yeah. Uh, but the, yeah, once it's trained, you will be able to do it on images of your city. Uh, mm -hmm. But again, since the number of rows will be really limited, I would uh, mm -hmm. displaying the outputs will be ill advised. <laughs> we need more uh, rows <laughs> and, and more, a larger data set for it to be for it to hold ground, academically speaking. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. All right, I suppose there are no further questions. I'm going to upload the recording in about half an hour's time within the same folder and we'll begin at the same time tomorrow. If we need to extend it by half an hour or an hour to cover all the three topics, I hope that won't be a problem for any one of you. And yeah, I request you guys to, at least for the designers column, add your uh, ratings. Uh, then we'll be able to explicitly use those directly for our uh, neural network training. Um, all right, it's two in the night over here. So I've got to crash and I'll see you guys tomorrow. Thank you for joining me. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Thank you very much.